4, chapter 1. This is what Paul says. Therefore, Ephesians 4, verse 1. I said chapter 1, the 9. Ephesians 4, verse 1. It says, Therefore, I, the prisoner for the Lord, urge you to, listen, walk worthy of the calling you have received. I like that. Walk worthy of the calling you received. Isn't that just a just a, a great statement? Walk worthy of the calling. We have a calling on us. Walk worthy. When I read that again this morning, I said to myself, Am I walking in a worthy manner? Not by my judgment, but according to the Scriptures. In verse 11 to 16, it says, And he personally gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And verse 12 says, For the training of the saints, that's us, the believers, in the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ. Look at that verse 12, to build up the body of Christ. You know, the giftings you have is not for your resume. It's not for your sales. It's not for your parking space or personal self-gratification. It's meant to build up the body of Christ, the ecclesia, the body of Christ. When people say they're functioning and they're gifting outside of the local assembly, they're missing the Scriptures and they're not working in a worth, walking in a worthy manner. Verse uh, 13 says, Until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's sons, growing into a mature man with a statured measure by Christ's fullness. Maturity. Growing into a mature man, woman. Do you know that God wants us to mature? Now, I know in, in some of our dictionaries, maturity means overripe or close to rotten, okay? But I'm not talking in that context. I'm talking about for our mentoring, where maturity is the acceptance of responsibility. If you do wrong, accept it, get it right. It's the acceptance of responsibility. And maturity is not by age. Just because I have no hair or a graying beard doesn't make me more mature or less mature because maturity is the acceptance of responsibility. And we go on here in verse 14. Then we will no longer be little children tossed by the waves and blown around by every kind of teaching, by human cunning, with cleverness and the techniques of deceit. I like that verse there. No longer be little children means grow up. I know in uh, Galatians 4.1, it says that we are so childish rather than childlike. We're called to be childlike in faith, but not childish in behavior. Does that make sense? And childish means that you are not mature to be able to handle the truth. All right? Don't be little children tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching. I mean, we have so many things online. It's so easy. It's amazing how many people get carried away with different things that is taught or shared that doesn't measure up, but we get carried away on things. Verse 15, but speaking the truth in love. Now, let me tell you something. Love's definition is denial of self for the benefit of others. So if you think you're speaking the truth in love, it should be denying of yourself, meaning it's not about you getting revenge or having your say or getting your bit back. Denying of self for the benefit of others. Verse 16, from the whole body, fitted and knit together by every supporting ligament, promotes the growth of the body for building up itself in love by the proper working of each individual part. We are part of a body. We're not on our own. And each part's got to be accountable. Verse 26 to 27 it says, be angry and do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. So how do I get angry and not sin? Well, Jesus showed us how in the Father's house you could be angry and not sin. And it says, and don't give the devil an opportunity. A, a better translation in the Greek is not the word opportunity because it sounds like the devil is that wedge during it, but rather it's a foothold. Don't let the devil have a foothold or a footing, meaning this. If you don't deal with things, the enemy gets a footing to launch in other areas. Oh, well, the devil did it. No, James 1 says when you are tempted or attacked, don't say God or anything else. You will be tempted, which is what the devil does to tempt, okay? Satan means deceiver, all right? You will be tempted, but he can't cause you to do it. When you sin, the devil can't make you do it. He can tempt you. And that's why every one of us have different weaknesses and that's what they play on the temptation. We act on it and temptation leads to sin and sin leads to death. 
In verse 30 to 32, and it says, Don't grieve God's spirit. You are sealed by him for the day of redemption. Listen to verse 31. Or bitterness, anger, and wrath, shouting and slander must be removed from you along with all malice. And be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God forgave you in Christ. You know, when you read, and you can go through the whole of chapter 4, but when you read Ephesians 4, it's a real great mixture of how we move in ministry, but also in grace. The ecclesia is the body of Christ. Verse 12, he wants it built up. Verse 13, he wants it mature, taking responsibility. Verse 14 to 16, no longer infants, but will grow up in every respect, mature. Chapter four, verse one says, live a life worthy of the calling you received. I, I look at all these areas and they stir me. And verse 26 to 27, in our anger don't sin. And verses 30 to 32, don't grieve the spirit. The spirit's living in you. Don't grieve the spirit. There are people who have got such malice and anger. I was praying and deceiving uh, last night. Uh, it was probably about 2, 2.30, I was praying for a particular couple of people. They're not in our church, but I was just in contact with them, praying over them. And they have so much hurt, justifiable, not justifiable, irrelevant, but they have so much hurt and they're trying to make decisions in God and they're not prepared to deal with the hurt. And I know they're not hearing from God because the things they're trying to do aren't working. And I was saying, God, let them be open to healing of that pain. And I was just crying out for it. That's what it says in verse 32, being kind and compassionate, forgiving each other. These are all the keys. You know, we're never more like God than when we learn to forgive. We think we're more like God when we move in demonstrative or demonstrative acts. We might feel like I'm more like God when I see the sick healed. I'm more like God when I preach a good word. I'm more like God when I do a great business deal. Let me tell you, as it says in Romans 11, the gifts of God are without repentance. You can move in the gifts of healing. You can move in the gifts of teaching. You can move in the gifts of business. You can move in the gifts of healing and not be right with God. I've known a case where an unsaved person led another person to the Lord. It was about 30 years ago, two addicts on the street. One addict was a backslidden Christian. The other addict had never known Christ and had heard a street preacher. And the addict who'd never known Christ said to the backslidden addict, I would like to know that Jesus, if only I had responded. And the other addict who was a backslidden Christian didn't want God and he cussed about the name of Jesus said, well, if you really want to know God, I'll lead you in the sinner's prayer. And so the backslidden, unsaved, unrespectful addict led the other one to the Lord. He got saved, went on with his life and became a preacher. And the other guy sadly died in their addiction. So what I'm trying to say is you can function in a gift, but we're not known by our gifts. I was with some pastors and they're talking about some controversial people. And they said, but they move in such a gift. And I said, but where does the Bible say you know them by the gift? It says it's the fruit of the Spirit. You can function in a gift and not be walking with God. I've known of preachers who have been having sexual relations with a woman and they've been on the platform for a couple of years preaching with demonstration of healing. I was with one preacher once and, and this preacher, I was... I really like this preacher. I was a trainee uh, youth staff person. I'm staff as a trainee person. And I had this period of a year where they had this youth pastor in, uh, a wonderful person, his wife, children. And I just, the minute I met them, I loved them. I just thought they were so anointed. And what, hap what happened was every time he gave an altar call, he'd cry. And everybody come on the altar and I said, God, after six months, I'm unworthy to be a preacher because in the altar call, I don't cry and everyone gets saved. I mean, like, I mean, even if you're born again, you got saved. I mean, I think I got saved, you know what I'm saying? Because it's convicted it. Well, you know what happened? And I've told the story before, 12 months later, this woman gets saved in the church 
And she goes to the pastor's wife and she says, I want to tell you, uh, I'm a prostitute and tonight I've come to church and I'm born again. I want to get out of it. And they said, wonderful. And I came from the church background where all the pastors sat on a platform. Do you remember that day where there would be a couple of rows of the pastors? There was the people and the pastors. Oh, I don't know if you know that. That's where I came from there. And she said, and that man there, she said, the youth pastor, yeah, he's my number one customer. Okay. It was not, it was the most tragic. I wept for a couple of days on that area because I lived on this side of the street. He lived four houses down the other side of the street. And all the time I thought it was encyclopedia salesperson. <laughs> it was a different type of house call. Okay. And the fact of the matter is I was fooled. I think that hurt me the most too. And, and the issue is, friends, is that you, you know, it didn't mean the people who got saved in his ministry then were no longer saved. You, you say, oh, well, you're no longer saved now because <laughs> they heard, a, you, know, you know, it's like a, a legal case of a lawyer has been, you know, it's all done. Now, they were still saved because they're being led to Jesus. So, what I'm trying to say is, man, we're never more like God than when we want forgive. Not when you function in your giftings. It's when you forgive. Throughout Paul's writing in Ephesians 4 and throughout the Bible, there's a direct connection between grace that God gives us through Jesus and the grace that God gives us to give to others. See, when it says don't be childish, it means grow up. And grow up means forgive. When you can't forgive, when you hold on to resentment, when you hold on the area, it means you are childish. Not childlike, childish. You're having a little tantrum. Previously in the messages, we saw that the first step in the journey of giving grace, this is how I finished it last week, was a willingness. You might not think they deserve it. You don't think that, they, they, that it's hard to do it. But even if you find it too hard to forgive right now, at least be willing to step out. In the next three messages in this series, I'll be laying out three significant markers of this journey of grace. Today is releasing our feelings of anger, bitterness, and rage to God. It's releasing the feeling of anger, bitterness, and rage to God. And the next message is about attach a name and a face to those feelings and be challenged to release the person who hurt us to God. And then the third one of this series, we address the possibility, I use the word possibility because it's not always possible, of reconciliation. The number one thing we deal with, friends, in forgiveness is emotions because our emotions tie us up. That's the number one problem, our emotions. Our emotions have a way of choking our resolve to forgive, our emotions. Our emotions are what I might describe as roadblocks that keep us from moving forward with forgiveness. They are roadblocks that keep us moving forward to forgiveness. It's time for all of us to do some growing up. And by growing up, it's being responsible, which is mature, to do what we may not feel like doing. That's maturity, the acceptance of responsibility. And instead of making this journey dependent on our emotions or relying upon our own resolve, we need to ask God's Holy Spirit to help us clean out our hurts, our closets, and finally get rid of the anger, the bitterness, the disappointments that have piled up and kept us from making progress. God wants you to progress. We tend to deal with our hurts and our anger in one of three ways. Number one might be called repression. Uh, too often, this is how we deal with hurts. We repress them. Instead of surrendering to God, which is the biblical thing, we push them down and try to repress our anger. We think that we are successfully dealing with our feelings by repressing them and not allowing them to come up and come out. The definition of, of repress is to suppress something by force. We forcibly hold it down. We fight our lip. We 
walk out the room, we hit the wall, we uh, repress it and we think it's better to have left than to have done something. So many of us have been taught to deal with our emotions in this way. Don't let anyone see them. Close the door to the office. The problem is that when we repress these emotions, they don't go away. You know what they do? They go toxic. They don't go away. They go toxic. Hebrews 12, 15, the theme of this series, says, see to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Remember I told you in the Hebrew uh, for the area, the word for bitter root means poisonous. That called the poisonous bitter. When you miss God's grace, bitterness, poison comes in and defiles you. So repressing anger leads to bitterness, poison, that leads us to missing out on the grace of God. If there's any hope of healing, we've got to learn to stop repressing our feelings We've got to learn to hold them up to God and examine them one piece at a time and decide if you want to keep them or let them go. Do you want to give them up and allow God to heal or are you deciding to hold them in and continue that journey? Some of you might ask, how can we tell if we have repressed anger or if we have repressed bitterness from wounds we receive? Now, I'm not saying that the wound you carry is because you did anything. I'm not saying that. But just because you're a victim doesn't mean you can't sin in the midst of your pain. Look for these warning signs. If we have become disproportionately angry over little things, that's a warning sign. Disproportionately angry over little things. It's not those little things. It's this repressed anger you're not dealing with. We find ourselves irritable, annoyed, angry over little things, over those around us who before then was like, oh, can't stand it. that person. If our constant irritability or our angry outbursts come out and we go like, oh, I don't know where that came from. It's not, oh, I don't know where it came from. It's, oh, I got caught. Another indication of repressed anger is we complain about everything. People who repress resentment over hurts they've received tend to see everything through negative lenses, always half empty. They'll always see the negative. They'll complain about teachers or co-workers or neighbours or relatives or servers or the church or the drivers or the pastor or their spouse. They can find negative in anything. Instead of seeing the world through a lens of grace, they see the world through the lens of bitterness because they have missed out on God's grace. And when you miss out on God's grace in Hebrew 12, the root of bitterness comes in. Another sign we may have with repressed anger is that we're overly sensitive and defensive. Probably right now, you might be feeling a little sensitive and defensive. Hang on a minute. Is he talking about me? I'm not overly sensitive. I'm not overly sensitive and defensive. I know that. I know that because no one has ever told me I'm overly sensitive and defensive. Do you know why no one's ever told you that you're overly defensive and sensitive? Because you go off your rocker. So they go like this around you. <laughs> you tell them. No, 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 no. I've kept these emotions contained in my closet. 
Let me tell you something. It's not well hidden. Bitterness, rage, anger are spilling out. It's leaking. Repressed, rehearsed. Rehearsed anger. Ephesians 4, 26 to 27. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. Do not give the devil a foothold. I call this rehearsed anger. It's not that you've come out and done things, but you're rehearsing it behind the scenes. If only I, if I was one day. One, it's a rehearsed anger. You act it out. Foothold captures the idea of an opportunity. Don't give the enemy a staging ground. When we repress or rehearse anger, we're giving the enemy a place to establish a base camp from which he's able to carry out a mission to separate you from God. Unresolved anger is the open door the devil can walk through to gain access to other rooms in your being. All kinds of health issues are connected to chronic anger. Heart disease, stroke, blood pressure, arthritis, insomnia, gastrointestinal problems, ulcers, lupus, skin problems, sleep problems. I'm not saying every case, just because you got that, I'm not saying that you're a bitter person. But they have said in each of these areas, okay, it can be a cause of built anger. Bitterness can create new health problems or it can exasperate existing ones. That's why when people come to me for prayer, I say, do you have unresolved issues? Is there any? The truth is these emotions not only mess up our minds, they can actually threaten our lives. It's been said that not forgiving someone is like drinking poison and then waiting for the other person to die and that might be truer than we think. Lisa, could you come up for me, please? It's been said that not forgiving someone is like drinking poison yourself and then waiting for the other person to die. When you have bitterness, you've drunken the poison and you're waiting for them to die when it's you dying. It was the article in the New York Times that said, researchers have gathered a wealth of data largely suggesting that chronic anger is so damaging to the body that it ranks with or even exceeds cigarette smoking, obesity, a high-fat diet, because of being a powerful risk factor for early death. So rehearsed anger also leads to relational problems. Bitterness can destroy any chance of intimacy in marriage because the partner says, I've had enough. Unresolved anger towards a parent can cause us to have misplaced anger towards our spouse. Before I could marry Sandra, before I even knew I was going to marry Sandra, I had to go through a process of forgiving my dad. Because if I didn't forgive my dad, I'd carry it into my marriage. If you're about to marry someone and they haven't dealt with the issues, don't marry them. Run. Run. Don't fall for the liar. It's just them. They'll carry it. They'll carry it. Anger towards our spouse can lead to misplaces of anger at our job. Transference is what I'm talking about. I think the devil came up with transference because he loves to use our anger to bring havoc in other relationships. It may not be misplaced anger. It may simply be that you don't have the emotional energy you need for your relationships because you're drained at all to nurse your resentment towards someone who's not even a part of your life anymore. People will carry resentment. Your father could be dead, but you're still keeping it alive. The person who hurts you is long gone, but you're keeping it alive and it's affecting the existence language. 
But rehearsed anger not only affects those who are meant to be dearest to us, but it also damages us spiritually. Paul says in Ephesians about not sinning in our anger, to get rid of all bitterness. He says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit in verse 30 of Ephesians 4. Why would the Holy Spirit be grieved because of the anger in our hearts? Because the heart is where the Holy Spirit's meant to dwell. He dwells within us to help us grow up. He's working to grow fruits in our lives. Galatians 5 tells us the kind of fruit that the Holy Spirit wants to grow in our lives. This is the fruit the Holy Spirit wants to grow in our lives. Love, joy, peace. Patient, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. That's when the Holy Spirit, you become born again, is in you. That's what He wants to develop. And if we're not leaving room for that, it grieves. If we keep rehearsing the anger, the weeds of bitterness, rage begin to grow and it chokes the fruit that the Holy Spirit wants to produce. The third area in regards to anger is what I call release. I know on a surface, Paul's direction to get rid of it doesn't seem helpful. And obviously, it was just a matter of getting rid of it. We would have done it all a long time ago. It's just like get rid of it, we would all do it, like throwing out a bucket of water. I don't believe that in talking about release that Paul is trying to dismiss or be simplistic. But rather, I think Paul wants us to understand what the only option is with hurt and resentment and anger. It's the only option. We can repress or we can rehearse our anger or we can take the third option of release it. Now, when I use the word release, please, I'm not making light of what has happened to you. I know some of you have experienced atrocities which are morally, legally wrong. So when I talk about release, I'm not speaking lightly of the pain you are in and the pain you've gone through. I'm not diminishing the seriousness of the offense or the severity of your pain. But saying release it may sound simple, but releasing it is difficult. In fact, I'd say, at least in my case, it was absolutely impossible on my own. If I was sitting across the table right now, we're having this conversation with some of you, this might be the time when you looked at me with a clenched jaw, gritted teeth, and said to me, Pastor, you just don't know what you're talking about. You don't know what I have gone through. You're right. By only the grace of God, I haven't gone through what you have. But also by the grace of God, you haven't gone through what I went through. But I can only look at the Bible. And I think of a man called Stephen. He was an early church leader time when there was a lot of opposition to speaking about Jesus. In Acts 7, Stephen tells a huge crowd about who Jesus is and what he did for them. And here's how they responded. Acts 7, 57 to 58. At this, they, the people who heard, covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at Stephen. They dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. That's not marijuana, that's rocks, okay? Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul, who would later at the conversion be called Paul. How would you react when a group of hate-filled people start throwing rocks at you, knowing they'll continue until you're dead? How would you react? Well, this is how Stephen reacted in Acts 7, 59 to 60. And while they were stoning him, while this is happening, I mean, the stones are coming, the blood's coming, the pain, Stephen prays. He says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and he cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he said this, he fell asleep. Before he was killed, he fell asleep. Stephen prayed that his murderers would be offered grace and forgiveness. Have you been murdered lately? Perhaps in other ways, but not physically. On his death moment, he prayed grace over them. 
He wanted them saved. Where did Stephen learn this from? Where did we learn anything from? Jesus. Jesus. Say Jesus. Jesus. Jesus was crucified. And he prayed from the cross for those who were killing him in Luke 23, 34. Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. Jesus prayed that God would offer his murderers grace and forgiveness. And when we live in grace, releasing does not mean giving up. It means giving it to God. When we live in grace, releasing doesn't mean giving up. It means giving it to God. Prayer is what makes forgiveness possible. It's what makes the impossible possible. What do you have that is seemingly impossible that needs to be turned into a possibility? Jesus and Stephen didn't look their murderers in the eye and say, I forgive me. They looked up to heaven and said, God, forgive them. You ever seen people in the movies about to die and they'd say that the Lord's Prayer, God, forgive me, I'm about to enter in. God, forgive me, show me grace before they got shot. You ever seen things like that? They didn't say on their death, Jesus didn't say on the cross, oh God, remember I'm your son, show me grace. Stephen didn't say, oh God, God, have mercy on me and do a cross sign. Have mercy on me, forgive me. No, they didn't pray for themselves. They already knew they're in the right place. How do I know? Their fruit. Their fruit was forgive them. Maybe if you struggle to forgive, this is a good place to start. The first step isn't to go to the person and say, I forgive you. No. But rather the first step is to pray and ask God to do what you haven't been able to do. It's between you and God, you release the pain to Him. If Stephen can do it while being stoned to death by his enemies, and if Jesus could do it while being nailed to a tree, then you can do it too. If you ask God, He will give you the grace you need. Take your anger. Take your rage. Take your resentment. Take your unforgiveness. Take your hurt. Take it to Him in prayer. Prayer is a release valve for your feelings, for your bitterness, and for your anger. Prayer. I found as I pray, especially in the morning hours, early morning hours, that God never talks to me about the other person in regards to how they have, I haven't acted, but He always talks to me about how I'm feeling about them. Never once does God talk to me about them saying, yeah, you're right feeling that, son. (laughs) Oh, yeah, that's right. There's a journey of hell for them. You know what I mean? God never does that. God always says to me this, why are you reacting? Well, you know, didn't you see what happened? Yeah. So why are you reacting? Well, come on. I thought you're my God. I'm their God too. Oh, come on. I'm going through stuff. I know. That's why I'm talking to you. Well, let's talk about it. All right. As long as it is about you and how you feel. Well, what about that scripture in Isaiah 54, 17? No weapon that is formed against your prospect, every tongue that rises in judgment, thou shalt condemn. Come on. I want to talk to you about your feeling. Why are you reacting? Well, I'm hurting. Why are you hurting? I don't know why. Let me help you. Let me open up your heart and find out why you're hurting. Why are you reacting this way? Why are you feeling this? Why? Why are you doing this? Why are you acting stubborn? Why are you so stubborn? Why? Well, you ever see like a little kid? Well, <laughs> come on. There's no condemnation with God. There's no, God will never condemn you. He'll never say you're out, you're finished. He'll convict you, meaning get it sorted out. He'll never condemn you. Never, never does God condemn. 